Earlier this week, we talked about a piece in Time Magazine, uh, in part of what I call the great nullification debate. Of course, there was a lot of coverage on the concept of nullification. Uh, in fact, a lot of slanted coverage on the concept of nullification. No matter what your thoughts are, whether you support it or, or against it, you, you had terms like un-American being thrown out there uh, to criticize proponents of this concept of nullification, while some of the very bashers who were using terms like that were also endorsing the concept of nullification. They just didn't use the word. But anyway, the, the author of a book on nullification nullification and and who's obviously got a strong following here in Montana in fact the Gallatin County GOP had him come out last month I believe it was to be the keynote speaker for their big dinner there is Dr. Thomas Woods the author of nullification in their new book rollback repealing big government before the coming fiscal collapse Dr. Woods good to have you on Voices of Montana this morning thanks a lot Aaron uh, I guess maybe just the first question. I've got a lot of questions just after reading. Uh, I haven't gotten all the way through rollback yet, but uh, a lot of questions just from what I have read. But your message to the Gallatin County GOP and, 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 and what you thought about how, how the speech came across. Well, it was nice that C-SPAN covered it, so we got a bigger audience even than was in that room. I was very pleased that there were people, there were, there were at least five, maybe six gubernatorial candidates in there. The uh, your U.S. congressman was there, um, and we had some people of, of significance in that room, and a lot of just you know good, regular, uh, patriotic Montanans there, and so it was great that people got to hear the kind of, kind of message I was giving because it was not the usual, you know, let's cut uh, 1.7% and you know everything will be okay. You know, it's, it wasn't the typical boilerplate kind of, you know, America's going to be going to turn out great no matter what we do kind of speech. No, I mean. Even this country could be driven into the ground if the sociopaths who govern us aren't stopped. That's basically my, my And I was message. going to say, the reason why you going to a, a GOP dinner in Gallatin County, why that's interesting is because you're not just, you're not just some partisan out there. You are one of these philosophical thinkers, and, and so you don't speak to a partisan crowd. In fact, you're very critical of Republicans as well as Democrats. Yeah, just because I, you know, I feel like uh, neither one of them has a whole lot to be said for itself uh, in terms of its government record and, and what it's done to the country. So basically, I just spelled it out like this. I said, here are the numbers. Here, here are the figures. Here's what's definitely going to happen if we continue with this nonsense of, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make it sound like cutting $38 billion is a serious thing. You know, we keep doing that. I, I said, basically, here's what's going to happen. But then the second thing, and this, both of these things, I think, give us uh, a lot of food for thought for, for the next hour. But the second thing is, you know, if we're going to make any progress against Washington, D.C., and trying to get our liberties back and get this thing under control, it's not enough to, to cut the budget, even though that's going to be hard in and of itself. We have to go after the kind of propaganda that kids have been taught in these ideological prison camps we call public schools. We've got to go after this propaganda that tells them that they'd all be helpless without the federal government, and how dare you want to cut back, because that would mean you know, no one would have safe food, and we'd all be probably dead somewhere if it weren't for Joe Biden watching over us, and we wouldn't have any art, and all the good things of civilization come from the federal government. I, this has got to be smashed as hard as possible because that's what gives rise to these big budgets. And, and I know we talk about a $14.3 trillion debt that's facing this country, but hundreds of trillions of dollars you speak of on top of that when you add up the unfunded liabilities that are out there. Roll back. I mean, you're talking about a coming fiscal collapse. How dire of a situation really is it in, in your mind? Well, it's it's pretty grim, and I say this as somebody who does not have a track record of being, you know, what's called a perma bear, who's just always pessimistic no matter what. I just think that in this case, the the the, the case for short term pessimism is is pretty good. I think long term optimism is still is is still also a good bet, but for the time being, it's going to be a rough road ahead. Basically, for this, just a couple quick reasons. One reason is. A lot of the warnings about indebtedness are actually now going to bear some fruit because I think people have thought for a long time, look, a lot of these scaremongers have been talking about deficits for a long time, and I haven't seen any consequences, so maybe this is a lot of worrying about nothing. Well, now we're going to see the real worry, and one of them is that even the government's own numbers, which we all know are ginned up to sound better than reality, tell us that by 2020, even in the best scenario, you know, good economy, low interest rates, 
we're still going to be paying about a trillion dollars a year just in interest payments on the national debt, and that's in the best scenario, which I frankly don't think we have a right to expect. So it's likely to be much worse than that. 70% so of problem. GDP by the end of the year. In fact, and, and I think maybe the American people are starting to realize just how, how much trouble we are in when it comes to spending, at least, you know, and obviously we don't look at the polls to guide us on, on what the answer should be, but certainly on what the concerns are that are out there when you've got at least 60% saying that, look, debt is part of a, is, is part of our economic problem. This is, you know, and just more government spending isn't going to help us economically. And right. I point to that that, that that Northern Cheyenne coal deal. Hey, simply get out of the way. Let them develop their resources. But instead, there's this thought of, oh, how can the federal government help us? Get out of the way. Yeah, that's a, that is exactly what it needs to do, because it has basically almost destroyed the prospects of, of the rising generation. I mean, we're, we're, there are no jobs, uh, and yet these young kids are going to have to prop up uh, this collapsing welfare state. It's, it, it's really atrocious. But I do see these polls, and I am heartened by them, but then I see other polls where people are asked for specifics. Here are ten things yeah. the federal government does. Which one would you want to cut? And The Economist magazine did a poll precisely that, and they found only one category where a majority of Americans said we need to cut, and that was foreign aid. So, okay, there's one half of one percent of the budget taken care of. What about the rest of it? Nobody wants to cut anything. Yeah, they just want it. So I don't think they realize the extent of the problem. And you're even seeing that with the Ryan plan, and and that's why we we raised the question, which is, uh, is anybody even going to be willing to do anything until it actually does fail? Does it? Do we actually have to fall on our face before anybody actually does anything about it? It, it could well turn out that way, because I mean, the subtitle of my book, Rollback, is repealing big government before the coming fiscal collapse, but it may be that we repeal it through the coming fiscal collapse. That's the thing that gets us going. And I know I've, I know I've got some listeners out there who, who, you know, they call anybody, they'd even call the Ryan plan, they call these guys trimmers, saying that, well, they're just, all they're yeah. doing is is just trying to prevent a, a coming collapse, and that, and in fact, they they literally say it. There's there's some some folks that are hardcore libertarians who simply say they're happy with what's happening. They're happy with overspending because this will bring an end to the big government they despise. Yeah, I mean, I kind of understand this philosophy. You know, the worse the better is is the, is the the shorthand. Uh, we've been trying. You know, we've seen this though for se- for several decades that people think, well, the deficit just can't get any bigger than this. Surely, it's all going to come crashing down. Uh, but I think really now we are facing this because when you combine that with the other big problem, uh, which is the entitlement programs, something has got to give. I mean, Social Security and Medicare are underfunded by about $114 trillion, which is twice the GDP of the entire world. So if the whole world doubled its GDP and then gave us all that stuff, then we could close this gap. Now, I, I am skeptical that that is going to happen. Yeah. So at some point, it's not a matter of, oh, we hate old people, or we just, I mean, really, come on, let's off not act like 10-year-olds, you know? This yeah. is a serious problem. And even President Clinton, he was still mic'd up, didn't realize it, said that to Paul Ryan. Well, I, I want to talk about this nullification debate, and typically I limit my callers to calling in once a week. I might give an exception to Derek and Whitefish because he's kind of been front and center in this nullification debate, so he might want to run something by and have a question for you. But folks, we do have lines open for you as we talk with Dr. Thomas Woods, the author of Nullification, and his new book, Rollback, 238-0111 or 866-NBS Live, back right after this. I finally had to shut Twitter off yesterday. I I know a lot of you folks are saying, why'd you even turn it off in the first? I mean, yesterday was just a day of absurd news. You've, You've got a judge looking at this medical marijuana lawsuit comparing medical marijuana, which is against the law. Now, folks can disagree about it, but either way, it's against federal law. So he's comparing it to how they distribute uh, pharmaceutical drugs uh, as if there's somehow uh, any, you know, there's a total similarity between the two. One that's against the law, one that isn't. Anyway, that was absurd, so I finally shut that down. Then you had this other story. What the heck was I just talking about? We were talking about it during the break. Uh, the other, oh, yeah, you had a, uh, an analyst with what was it, the State Department of Labor, uh, confirm. Uh, he, he did his own report, and he found that, that, um, that the public employees union has a legitimate complaint against the state. Oh, okay, good. So a state employee backed up a state employee union complaint. Big shocker there. Not say, whether he's right or wrong, folks, look. You know, he is a state employee. Of course he's going to support what they're saying. Not news. 
anyway. What is news is the mounting federal deficit. And I know we could talk about this Afghanistan policy. Hey, look, that we already talked about that a year ago when we already knew that the president was planning to undercut his own strategy one year after he started it anyway. So here we go. Uh, how much more can we talk about that? The deficit is huge. We've got Dr. Thomas Woods, author of Rollback, on the phone with us. In fact, we've got, uh, we're going to take phone calls as well. We've got Jeff on the road to Lewistown, and uh, he's out uh, driving trucks, so he might lose cell phones. So, in fact, we're going to hold off on the headlines. Let's just go right to Jeff's phone call here on Voices of Montana with Dr. Thomas Woods. First, he's on line two. Three, I'm sorry. Jeff, you there? Jeff, go ahead. Uh, All right. He's, well, I hear his radio in the background. Keep listening to your radio. Uh, keep your eyes on the road. Anyway, we're going to get into some phone calls here. 2380111 or 866-NBS-LIVE as we talk with Dr. Thomas Woods. Uh, as we talk with, oh, okay, Brian says it was his fault, Jeff, on, on the on the microphone. So hold on one second. We're going to get to you right after we hear the 60-second headlines with Brian Bennett. A Montana Department of Labor investigator in a report says that there is probable merit to the unfair labor practice charge filed by state employee unions with the Board of Personnel Appeals. After the legislature refused to adopt raises, the unions had negotiated with the Schweitzer administration. U.S. District Judge James Reynolds says that he may temporarily strike down portions of Montana's new medical marijuana law, if not the entire statute, before it is scheduled to take effect on July 1st and promised an order, if not a full decision, by next Thursday, June 30th. The Missoula City County Health Department has granted the University of Montana an air quality permit for construction and operation of a $16 million of woody biomass gasification boiler, concluding that UM's proposal to burn wood meets all ambient and air quality standards. The Southern Poverty Law Center, based in Montgomery, Alabama, has identified 54 hate groups operating in the northwest United States, including 13 scattered around Montana. With Montana News Headlines, I'm Brian Bennett. All right. Thanks, Brian. Hey, we'll try this one more time. We've got Jeff on the road to Lewistown listening to KXLO on line three. Good morning, Jeff. I think we can hear you this time. Good morning. Yeah, go ahead. Yep, we got you. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, The thing that keeps hitting me with uh, so much of what we're doing these days is the implied full faith and credit of all of the different paper-backed either securities, currency, any of that. And I think it's kind of paradoxical or ironic that deficits may or may not matter. It's all on paper. And unfortunately, the money people have invested has all been and funneled right down to Wall Street, whether it's in a public employee retirement fund or privately held 401k or, uh, you know, retirement account that an individual may have, um, if a SEP, something like that. It's all skewed to go toward Wall Street. It's all backed in paper, and very little of it is in hard assets, whether it's gold or silver or real estate or uh physical commodities that a producer may may own in terms of cattle or grain on the ground or in the in the bin um, maybe maybe none of it matters if it's on paper but there's the emperor wears no clothes I mean all of this value all of the deficit all of the debt all of the asset value most of it's on paper yeah and so does it really matter whether we run it up till till, till the cows come home or are we just passing playing a game of musical chairs where we're passing this uh, bag of poop uh, on and on and on down the road. And well, or not even on paper, it's electronic. Not even on paper, yeah, it's electronic, it's, yeah. Yeah, Jeff, so hey, appreciate it, your it phone really call. Matter, it, when, it, when it unravels, where, where are we going to be? And I honestly believe the currency of the future, if we really cared about tangible reality, it's not gold or silver because that's just as arbitrary as paper. It's something that matters to all of us, and it's units of energy and BTUs, and that should be the global currency. All right. There, there has been talk of oil being the uh, global currency. Jeff, good to hear from you. Dr. Thomas Woods, I know you've talked a lot about the, the Federal Reserve in your book, Rollback, uh, and, and the constant printing up or, or at least uh, uh, making more electrons of money. Your thoughts on, on- 